All right, I have the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me welcome everybody. Let me welcome you to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator. I'm your host, I'm your cat herder, and I'm your guide to the next hour of conversation about the future of higher education. This brings together two very, very important developments that we've been working with. Over the past few years, we've talked about how income and wealth inequality has been rising in the United States and other nations. At the same time, we've been talking about how higher education has been producing more and more students. Gary Roth has written about these two problems by bringing them together into a powerful, powerful book, which I cannot recommend enough, The Educated Underclass. Very short, incredibly accessible, ruthlessly researched, makes the argument that higher education is producing some pretty lousy outcomes for a disturbing number of people. If you haven't had a chance to read it, you should have a button on the bottom left of your screen. You can click that and be taken to the Pluto Press page for it so you can buy one right away. Uh, we're gonna be talking about this today. Um, Gary is, among other things, an emeritus professor, former vice chancellor for academic programs and policies, and dean of the graduate school at Rutgers University. Uh, he is, as well, a very, very um, humane, uh, very direct, uh, and I think a very, very powerful uh, thought leader in this field. Uh, I would love to um, introduce you and to get a sense of where he is headed in this program. Uh, hang on one second. I'm having a browser glitch that I'm trying to solve, and I'll bring Gary up as soon as I get this fixed up. In the meantime, um, take to the chat box, make sure you've introduced yourself, and see about thinking about questions you'd like to ask Gary. ways of accidentally closing off the entire session. Sorry about that. Let me bring um, Professor Ross back up on stage. Hello. Hi, Brian. It's really good to see you, Gary. Yes, you too. Thank you so much for this invitation. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Your book is, as I said, very, very important. Uh, we you. have a lot to discuss, and I'd like to begin by asking you uh, to introduce yourself by answering an unusual question which is what are you going to be working on for the next year? What are the big projects and topics that are uppermost in your schedule and on your mind? Yes, so yes, I've started on, on a, on a uh, I'm hearing uh, an echo, hearing I don't know if that's from my uh, end or you don't hear the echo? No, there's a, there's a little bit of background noise on your side, but it's okay, we can hear you. Oh clear. yeah, okay, uh, fine. Uh, oh, it seems to have disappeared, so. Good. Um, so anyway, uh, I've started on a new uh, writing uh, project that picks up on themes that I uh, started to develop in educated underclass. And so this relationship between social mobility and higher education is one that, that continues uh, to interest me. And um, I kind of stubble, stumbled across uh, this information about you know, college graduates, graduates of four-year colleges who wind up in jobs for which you don't need a college education. And uh, this data is, is produced by economists at the Federal Reserve Bank. And uh, they put together you know, a, 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 a fair amount of very useful information. But when I first came across uh, their data, I mean, I'd always wondered, you know, I, I spent uh, most of my career as an administrator in higher ed, uh, and then the last decade, excuse me, turned to teaching. Uh, and, uh, and I would teach occasionally, you know, along the way as well. And I always wondered what happened to students after they graduated. Because, uh, you know, you'd hear from students periodically who might need a, a letter of reference for graduate school or for uh, work. But otherwise, you know, the, the bulk of students just kind of disappeared afterwards. And so when I ran into uh, and, and uncovered this data from the Federal Reserve economist, it really, you know, kind of uh, 
put into context some of what I had suspected um, anyway. So I want to pick up on, on that theme. And the, the new work is tentatively uh, titled Access and Exclusion, a College, Class, and Social Mobility. Uh, and so, you know, situation, you know, on the one hand, we have uh, uh, about one third of all college graduates. Uh, so, <clears throat> excuse me again, college graduates between all ca college graduates between the ages of 22 and 65 wind up in jobs for which uh, you do not need a, a college education. And it's a, the, just the number of, of graduates in that category is kind of staggering. And yeah. so I think it prompts then a rethinking of the, the value and the purpose of college education, how we think about the relationship between education and social mobility, and especially in terms of upward mobility. And up, you know, college education in terms of upward mobility was, you know, for the, until really the post-World War II era, no one spoke about upward mobility in terms of education. I mean, the hmm. purpose, the purpose of higher education from really when the university and college system really kind of, you know, gets going in the late 1800s, right up until the post-World War II period, its function more or less was to provide lateral uh, mobility for portions of the middle and upper middle and upper class. So it was a, a way in which families could more or less guarantee that their children would continue to live the kinds of lifestyles and have the type of status that they had grown up with. But uh, starting in really the late 40s and then through the 1950s and 60s, higher ed education community expands greatly, much faster than population. So a bigger proportion of the population goes to college. And for the first time, large numbers of students from working class backgrounds enter the university system. Right, so that kind of really, you know, the first generation students is a phenomenon really of the 50s and 60s. Uh, mm. And, you know, this kind of socioeconomic reshuffling of social class you know, it, it's also accompanied at that time of big discussions of whether social classes are disappearing, of whether there's just one big middle class with pockets of the very wealthy and pockets of the very poor on either end, but more or less <clears throat> this universal uh, middle class. And then, so, and higher ed does this by expanding enrollments. And then in the 1970s, it turns its attention as well to underrepresented minorities, mm -hmm. African-Americans and Latinx students in particular. And so the multicultural agenda is added to its kind of socioeconomic agenda in terms of uh, economic uh, uh, uplift. And then in the 90s, immigrants and the children of, of immigrants uh, are included. So, you know, in this immediate, you know, last 70 years or so, we see this, this on the one hand, this very rapid transformation of society itself in terms of the social fabric and the role that higher ed plays in terms of, ed, you know, educating uh, groups that had educated before, but now also new groups as well. Uh, and so a very kind of progressive social uh, uh, mission, but that at the same time it runs into economic barriers which undercut uh, the, the level of success that it might have had otherwise. What are those economic barriers? Uh, the, the, you know, most job uh, or a good portion of job creation these days happens at the very low end. Uh, you know, the three biggest areas for job growth projected over the next 10 years are home care, aids, uh, home care and, and personal aids, uh, restaurant uh, uh, employees, and hospitality and leisure uh, employees. And you know, those are the three biggest growth areas in terms of numbers of employees, all of which, you know, pay less than what's been accepted uh, as the living wage of $15 an hour. Uh, and many of those positions besides a part-time uh, end without benefits. 
so there's a tremendous growth of, of kind of low wage work. Uh, and at the other end, uh, a lot of the uh, work that's many of the positions that are developing are very high end in terms of uh, technical computer skills uh, or, or healthcare skills, but they're high end and oftentimes involve not just a, a bachelor's degree, but you know, uh, uh, a training in either sciences or in mathematics or in you know com uh, the technical fields of uh, computerization, and also a graduate degree. So we have a stratification happening both in society um, and also within higher education. And higher education is making that stratification happen. Yes, I, and I think you know it's. I mean, part of what I attempted to do in educated underclass was situate higher ed within those larger economic forces. Uh, it's you know higher ed you know isn't free to just decide on its own what it wants to do and what directions it, it plans to go in. And in fact, a lot of the enrollment growth was propelled because institute, you know, beginning in the 1970s, uh, when there was a you know major uh, kind of economic meltdown and also reshuffling of the global economy, um, government support for education started to fall away. And it's been very erratic since that time. And institutions of higher education have, have you know, had to depend on themselves more and more. And so enrollment growth was one of the ways that they could compensate for the lack of government funding. And, and by and large, enrollment growth is very easy to do. Uh, because if you have, for instance, if you have or, uh, planned a class already, you've already paid, you know, counted for the instructor's salary, you have a classroom. And so then uh, admitting additional students to that class is really just marginal costs. You know, yes, there's some more processing in terms of the registrar's functions and uh, a bit more advising that needs to be done to get students into classes and so on. But it's, it was a very kind of, you know, and enrollment growth allowed higher education to accommodate all groups. It did not have to, for instance, uh, 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 reduce the number of white students coming into the university system in order to admit students from other backgrounds. It expanded so rapidly that all students, in a sense, could find a place within within higher education. And so it was really, you know, growth makes makes that kind of diversification process, you know simple on that level. I mean, there are other issues that then then come to bear. But in terms of a, a strategy, which, you know, one, universities and colleges had to uh, follow in terms of raising revenues, but a strategy that simultaneously allowed it to have a very ambitious social mission and a very progressive one, it was really, in a sense, ideal circumstances. Let me pause just for one second. Uh, just First of all, I'll give you a chance to catch your breath and to uh, and get some water. But also, I want, I want to make sure I welcome a few people who've come in lately. Um, but also just to say, um, uh, again, this is the Future Trends Forum. We have our guest, Gary Roth. And I want to do a shout out to uh, uh, my friend, uh, Don Shawless, uh, who introduced me to uh, Gary's work. Hi, if Don. You, <laughs> if, you, if you'd like to uh, check out Don's own work, uh, he runs the uh, Higher Edu Education Inquirer uh, on blogspot.com. And I'll share that in the uh, in the chat box. Don does really, really great work, a uh, passionate advocate, and I just wanted to give him uh, a shout out right now. Uh, also, if you're um, if you're new to the forum or if you haven't uh, been with us for a while, uh, we've had programs that cover some of these topics in the past, including uh, two sessions with uh, Chris Newfield, who is the leading scholar of how state governments have defunded public higher education. Uh, again, if you're new to the forum, now the floor is yours. If you have questions you would like to ask, please just use either the Q&A box to type them in so I can flash them on the screen, uh, or click the raised hand button to join us on stage. I, I promise Gary and I are very nice, uh, and we're happy to have, happy to, uh, have you alongside us. Um, and uh, as I say this, there are already uh, some questions, and I want to share um, one of them from someone who's logged in under the pseudonym Overeducated. And she says, because I know who it is, is the only mission of institutions of higher education to prepare a future workforce? 
Well, no, I, I don't believe it is. And, and particularly if you're working in the humanities, most certainly it's not, you know, the, the, the kind of the idea that, that higher ed would prepare students for any kind of profession is, you know, gives, uh, prompts quite a bit of discussion. But I think from students' point of view, yes, there's a direct, and families' point of view, there's a direct connection between education and the future. And the future means that you must work. I mean, everyone basically, unless you're, you're extremely wealthy or, or really very, very poor, uh, everyone has must work. Uh, and by and large, everyone does work uh, until unless they can find some alternate way of supporting themselves. So uh, I don't think you can get around the issue of work. Uh, and, you know, uh, and it's, you know, no matter what a student's major is, I think that issue of what they'll do after graduation always hangs over them. You know? I got in an interesting uh, Twitter fight with a, a much older professor who um, told me that uh, I was overestimating the economic value. And, um, and I pointed out just the enormous costs of higher education right now. And he wasn't interested in that. Um, uh, we have uh, questions that have come in all over the place, uh, including from uh, uh, Charles Finley. Uh, so let me just flash this on the screen so you all can see it. And uh, Charles asks, is the growth in new outreach for the survival of the institution to the detriment of newer groups of students who will not get jobs? Yes, I mean, that seems to be the irony of the situation. Uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, underemployment uh, is a phenomena that isn't widely discussed in higher education. Um, there's a you know a handful of academic studies that you can turn to to get information uh, about um, uh, the underemployed, uh, but by and large the interest has been in students up until the point uh, that they graduate. So there's been lots of research in terms of the recruitment of college students and making sure that you know uh, the the entering classes rep are representative of the population as a whole. Uh, and then kind of quickly following that interest in the higher ed community was a, an interest in uh, retention, given kind of historically low retention rates uh, mm -hmm. uh, as you go down kind of the, the you know, if you rank uh, uh, institutions of higher ed in terms of the socioeconomic background of the students that they attract, you know, graduation retention and graduation rates tend to get lower and lower uh, the, the kind of less wealthy that the student body is. Uh, and there's also then gen gender dimensions in terms of majors uh, that students choose. And then there's the, the racial and ethnic and, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, statuses of students as well. And so there's been lots and lots of focus on what happens to students while they're in college, how to retain them, and how to make sure that they graduate. But kind of once you get to graduation and they leave the door, there's not much information uh, about students. So uh, one of the value of what the Federal Reserve economists has done is that they've taken you know, a very good look at, at some of the relevant information. You, uh, you rely heavily on that data, which is, which is crucial data. Um, that's really, really important to see. Uh, thank you for that great answer, Gary. And uh, Charles uh, at Northeastern, thank you for a typically penetrating question. Uh, we, have, we have more questions coming in. <laughs> I want to make sure we get a chance to, uh, for everyone to, uh, to weigh in. Uh, this is from Gretchen Haskell, the University of Missouri, who asks, what experiences with students led you to research the overeducated underclass? Well, what really did it for me was that uh, I began to teach uh, an internship uh, class for students. This is in, in the Department of uh, Sociology or Sociology and Anthropology at uh, Rutgers University in Newark. And um, some of the class, we, we only met once uh, every other week, uh, and then otherwise students uh, were placed into internships, you know, non-paying, uh, for the most part, non-paying internships, so volunteer work, but a chance for them to 
uh, take a look, mostly in, in social service agencies is where they wound up. And um, so we would spend the time together uh, reading uh, uh, about the future of the economy, particularly in terms of uh, technology and automation and what was coming down the road. Uh, but also we'd spend a lot of time talking about their experiences at their internships. And uh, I was kind of taken aback by one, you know, um, how little students understood about uh, how to work, you know, how to conduct themselves in a workplace, uh, how, to, how to deal with situations at work. Um, and then also, you know, as they got, we spent a certain amount of time then, you know, trying to get them ready for applying for jobs, kind of how lost they were in that process of where to apply and how to apply. And so increasingly, I did this course for a few years, I reoriented the course more towards practical skills, just because it made me uncomfortable that they were, you know, as unprepared as they were. And this is at a time where, you know, there's a, a very good but very understaffed career development center, uh, which was increasingly offering services online. Uh, and that's, so it meant it was offering more things to students, uh, but at the same time, the impersonality uh, of it meant uh, that students did not know fully how to take advantage of the situation and how to how, how really uh, to kind of orient themselves. It's, I mean, I think it's a lot about, you know, kind of internet experience in which you can just be overwhelmed by the amount, by the number of possibilities there. Um, and so, yes, so, uh, so when I came across this data then about the, the, uh, underemployed, it clicked then also with what I was seeing in the classroom uh, with students. Thank you for that uh, for that deep answer. I love how you your integration of uh, research and your experience with students. Um, also, if you get a chance, uh, everybody, the first um, the introduction to this book uh, offers an autobiographical introduction as well, which is really important. Um, thank you, uh, Gretchen, for the question. That's yes, uh, a very good question. Indeed, indeed. Uh, we have a, a macro question from uh, Chris Delarocas at Boston University, where he's an associate provost. And Chris asks, one often hears that a society with more educated people is going to somehow generate more jobs requiring educated folks. Are there any examples of this happening <laughs> anywhere in the world? <laughs> yes, it's it, that idea comes from supply side economics. Yes. Oh, you, yes. Oh, <laughs> goes wow. back to JB, the economist JB Say in the late 1700s yeah. that supply yeah. will create its own demand. Um, no, I think you're perfectly right. Uh, there's, you know, not not any or not many examples of uh, that happening. I will say, though, what seems to be is that m that there are uh, many employers who have job openings uh, for positions which do not require a college education, but who w will prefer to hire a college graduate anyway, and will also pay that college graduate uh, uh, thousands more than they would pay a non-graduate, even though they could hire a non-graduate for the job. So there's an employer preference, uh, and one, one person explained the employer preference comes from the fact that the overwhelming majority of employers are themselves college educated. Mm -hmm. uh, but w you know, whether that's the, the, the reason or not, I mean, employers, I think, value uh, a college education because, you know, it means that, that uh, you know, these future employees have spent more time in a classroom. Uh, they've had to be self-reliant, self-disciplined. They've learned how to work in teams. They've learned how to remove their ego from kind of business decisions. And they're, you know, they can work on their own. They can read instructions and follow you know, instructions. They know how to ask 
questions, you know, that they, they you know, don't necessarily see asking questions as, as a, a reflection on their own ability to work and so on. The college environment, you know, so they've had years of practice at these kinds of skills uh, and uh, it then makes them uh, attractive as potential employees. This is a, uh, first of all, I just have to say, Chris, that's a beautifully phrased question. <laughs> and, uh, and I think, uh, uh, Gary, your, your work in macroeconomic history really, uh, really plays out here, uh, shining where this is, um, why this is a historic mistake. Um, let me see if I can uh, beam uh, another uh, questioner up on the stage. Let's see if uh, Judith can join us. Judith, hello. Hello. I'm planning to eat and listen, not talk. This is oh, a wonderful I'm, talk. It's great to see you. It's great to see you. It's good to see you too. Gary, I just wanted to know if you have any data that you could speak to about the shift from employers expecting to train their own staff to employers expecting higher education to train their staff. Because my question was to the point of my, my own mother who had a, a master's education really was uh, onboarded at Wang at a point in her career when Wang expected to be able to do that. And that, you know, fueled the rest of her career. My impression is that employers now don't want to do any onboarding, any training, any staff development. And I don't know if you have any data about that. Uh, I don't. I don't know that that data, uh, and I, I think it's a, a mixed bag in terms of employers. So certain certain areas, uh, you're expected to have particular kinds of skills. For instance, if you're in a technical area, there's a, a whole level of technical skill that you can learn in school, and employers expect that. In terms of if you're in manufacturing, though, the manufacturing processes oftentimes are so specific that you must be trained on the job. So you can have the general, you know, skills in terms of the work being done. Um, and with, you know, so-called white collar work, then there's a, you know, kind of a generic set of skills that one brings with you uh, in terms of communication and teamwork and decision making and so on. And again, those are things that, you know, the uh, educational institutions are expected to, to, uh, to provide students with. So, um, and how that works out then in terms of the of the workforce, uh, I think is is very hard to determine. Uh, there's you know periods in which employers squawk that you know college graduates aren't prepared, uh, and there's other periods in which you know don't don't prepare them too much because we'll train them once they get here. So. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm interested to see if, if uh, how your research in that area develops. I attended an interesting panel in Washington, D.C. some years back when manufacturing companies were complaining that our uh, higher education, especially community colleges, were not graduating the types of people that they wanted to just go into their jobs with their own certification. So I think there's a lot of pressure there. Yes, and I think that situation over the last couple of decades has changed quite a bit too, because at one point the the business world and parts of the political world were were both criticizing higher ed uh, for not teaching relevant skills for the workforce, and so part of what happened within higher ed was this kind of reshuffling uh, of uh, progr programmatic offerings. And so whenever there's kind of a, a, a perceived need for graduates in a particular area, higher ed institutions tend to be very nimble these days in terms of creating programs, both on undergraduate and, gra and even more so on the graduate level that cater to employer needs. So the gaps between kind of business needs and educational training has narrowed because institutions you know, heard that criticism and then became much more, much, much more versatile in terms of responding to those needs. Great answer. Judith, great question. Thank you so much. Uh, if you're new to the forum, that's an example of a video question. You can see how easy it is to do. Uh, just uh, let me know by pressing that raised hand button if you'd like to join us on stage. Uh, we had a quick observation I just wanted to share from Joseph Robert Shaw in the chat. Uh, he mentions that Huntsville, Alabama is in the middle of such an economic swing, much like Silicon Valley and Seattle went through in the 80s and 90s respectively, thanks to the military industrial complex and of course the new interest in space. 
Uh, good point, Joseph. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, we also have a question from uh, Don Charles, and I want to make sure that he gets his question because um, I'm very grateful to him. And this has to do with uh, employers from another side. What do you think about gainful employment rules for college programs? Uh, Obama had those regulations for for-profit colleges. Yeah, uh, and first let me say I am also a big fan of, of Dawn's writing and, and uh, follow his blog. And so uh, very pleased that he's uh, joined us and, and is posing this question. Um, the, the, if, I, if I can, I'd like to, to, po to pose that question within a wider context. I mean, one response to uh, the knowledge that you know, so many college graduates uh, uh, could have applied for their positions, you know, without graduating college uh, is the idea to kind of somehow rationalize uh, the college experience. You know, if there's too many, too many graduates are, are uh, employed in jobs for which you don't need a college education, then in one way or another, then let's educate fewer students. That seem would be a, a very rational approach. Yeah. The problem is, is how do you decide who gets excluded? Mm -hmm. right? And so, mm -hmm. you know, through really up until the post World War, well, up until certainly the late 1800s, you know, the education, higher education, was all white and it was all male. Uh, and then late 1800s, you know, uh, special schools start to be founded for uh, women students, special schools for African Americans, uh, and and uh, so and then this you know kind of ongoing struggle of the higher education community over the last decades to eliminate those kinds of biases in how higher education functions. The problem though, so, and part of the, the response to those kinds of gender or race or ethnicity based prejudices was to turn to a merit system. The problem though, is that merit systems also produce their biases and that, you know, it, system based on merit then produces a bias in, in terms of socioeconomic factors. So, you know, the, the, the wealthy or the family situation of this, of uh, this college applicants, then, you know, the greatest degree to which adults have overseen and, you know, and, and channeled their upbringing in terms of the kinds of skills and, and competencies that higher education prefer, particularly in terms of mathematics skills and then writing and speaking skills. Uh, and so, you know, because there's that socioeconomic bias within merit system, then merit doesn't become a way uh, to, you know, merit itself is not a way to rationalize education. So, so, you know, if if education, you know, if the idea is to shrink the number of college students, someone's going to suffer. And then the question becomes, who is it that's going to be targeted? You can do it socioeconomically, you know, through a merit system, or you could do it in terms of kind of cruder and gross, you know, prejudices towards one group or another. That's that's a devilish question, and I'm really glad you put that on the table because uh, that is one way forward. Um, that is one way we may be headed. In fact, um, yes. And if I could add just just one more one more piece of that, I mean, it's also the case that since 2010, uh, enrollments in in uh, colleges and universities has been more or less stagnant. Right. So for a decade now, and this is the first time since, you know, the early beginnings of the, the college and university system that enrollments have stagnated for such a long period. Right. There's been downturns before, but usually it's just one, two, three years and then enrollments back up. Yeah. Uh, 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 bounce back and enrollments continue to grow. That's not the case now. They've been stagnant. The population continues to grow. So overall, then access is already shrinking during the last decade, and two groups in particular have been affected. One group is black students, African 
Americans. Uh, and there's been you know, a fair amount of discussion about the factors behind that, rollback of affirmative action programs and uh, uh, you know, the just general nature of racism in this society. But the second group that's already on the decline in terms of numbers of students enrolling in college, colleges and university is white students. And I, I haven't seen any discussion about that phenomenon. In term, I mean, there's lots of discussion about what's happening to, for instance, the white working class. Um, but I haven't seen any discussion about why you know, white college student enrollment is declining. So access for both those groups is already shrinking. Um, and that's you know, why the societal processes at work. True, true. Uh, I, I want to make sure that uh, everybody gets a chance to uh, to share their thoughts. And uh, there are a few more questions that have come in. A couple are, are more at the uh, uh, kind of almost philosophical or conceptual angle. And I want to put these together because these are uh, these are very important and they take us in a little bit of a different direction. A uh, longtime friend and supporter of the program, Tom Hames, asks this, is there a question of quality versus quantity here? If students are not graduating with skills to make them successful human beings, the degree is just paper. Is the degree a useful metric? Yeah, uh, and um, it's, it's not that it's not, it's not that the underemployed don't have skills. It's just that there's not jobs there, and so they tend. And in the data that's been done of the underemployed college graduates. Uh, about half of them wind up in jobs, which the Fed economists term good, good non-college jobs, meaning jobs which pay on average forty-five thousand dollars a year or more. Um, and so, uh, you know, so income-wise, uh, uh, the those graduates. Uh, aren't doing so badly. Um, but there's a, a kind of ricochet effect then at work because the college graduates are taking jobs that non-college graduates would have taken otherwise. So there's a kind of downward pressure on the workforce in terms of you know who's who's getting what jobs uh, because if the high end non college jobs are being filled to a substantial degree by college graduates it means that non college graduates then have to you know dip lower in terms of the kinds of jobs, meaning the quality of the jobs, how interesting they are versus how repetitive, whether the jobs that have a future attached to them or not, and in terms of, of uh, the wage scale. Uh, so I think part, we hear a lot about the, the terrible economic pressure that the working poor are under, uh, uh, but and, and inadvertently, I think that, you know, high and higher education's uh, desire to educate as much of the population as possible has this kind of negative effect of actually uh, contributing to the deterioration of employment conditions for people who don't have that education. Thank you. That's uh, Tom always asks very, very powerful questions. And Gary, I really appreciate the answer there. Um, the uh, chat box is blowing up. People are arguing about, um, about how to arrange higher education and talking about different forms of critical thinking and economics. So if you're, folks, if you're not paying attention to the chat box, take a look. There's a lot there going on. Uh, and we have uh, Ken who wants to join us on stage. Let me see if I can get his uh, uh, podium working. Hey, Hello, Ken. Me, hold on, let me get my camera going here. I don't know why my camera's not working. Um, yeah, I can see your photo, but I can't, but I can hear your voice. So let's, let's go with that for now. All right. Thanks. Hey, I, I just want to ask, uh, uh, I know I, I've been in this field for 40 years, started as a dorm director, moved my way up to university president. And the one thing that really frustrates me, and now I like to consider myself a recovering uh, university president. Um, <laughs> the one thing that, that really has bothered me for 40 years is the fact that we have a requirement, 120 semester hour requirement for a bachelor's degree that was established in 1906 by a group of Ivy League institutions for the purpose of, of establishing a pension system it has nothing to do 
with yeah. academic achievement. We sit around as, as, as quote, experts uh, and advocates for our profession, and we talk about lowering costs, lowering costs, free this. Why don't we have an honest and open conversation about the fact that the current 120 semester requirement is, is, is unsubstantiated. Uh, it is just a hodgepodge of stuff for many kids that means nothing, that's not connected. The Brits have been doing a three-year degree program for, for, for generations. And why can't we talk about a three-year, 90-semester bachelor's degree um, moving forward and save people a lot of time and a lot of energy? I throw the question back to you. Uh, just for, first, Ken, I want to thank you for that. You've got a bunch of fans in the chat box, so just want to make sure you know that. Go ahead, Gary. Yeah, I'd just like to say good luck having that discussion with faculty. So we, I wish you, yes. Um, it's not really a response. I mean, again, <laughs> we have a commitment to educate the masses, but we have a system that was never set up to do that. And all we can talk about is cutting costs. Why don't we cut time that, that we can truly create? If we can put a man on the moon, can we create a, a meaningful? Uh, the Brits have been doing it. I, I know there's issues with the unions, but, you know, it, it is about the kids. It is about our country. And so I'll I'll stop and get off my soapbox. But I think ultimately, if we don't do it, the pressures from outside state and federal will do it for us. Yes, I mean, I, I can just add you know, something a, a, a little bit to that. I mean, uh, at the school that I, I've uh, worked at, there are general education requirements, uh, which which uh, uh, I'd say most undergraduates don't, you know, you have to take so many credits in social sciences and, and so many in the sciences and composition and math and so on and so forth. And uh, many you know, I'd say most undergraduates I've ever spoken to about the gen ed requirement do not like them, do not understand them. Um, but one of the things that uh, education does for people, I think, is that it makes them much more versatile intellectually. And uh, so, you know, the, they're aware of so many different things. They're introduced to many, many uh, people and types of people. They're involved in, in, you know, different situations. And so it makes them kind of socially and intellectually much more versatile than they would be if they simply kind of grew up in a family and then transitioned from that family into the workplace. I mean, workplaces tend not to be particularly, you know, educational experiences. It depends on the workplace, of course, but by and large, you know, one doesn't go to work in order to get an education. Um, right. Right. And so, you know, the general education requirements, even, you know, that I think their rationale isn't very well explained to students. And or if it is, it's explained to them before they can really appreciate it. Uh, but so there's something to be said, in turn, even though college education turns out to be somewhat chaotic in terms of the mix of courses that students are exposed to, nonetheless, and given how rapidly this economy and, and, and social life uh, changes, uh, you know, it seems to be on a, a, you know, an ever increasing treadmill, uh, the, the college experience in, in that sense is quite useful to everyone who goes through it. Well, thank you. Ken, uh, first of all, I'm glad you are the first forum uh, participant to have identified yourself as a recovering president. And, I, and, I love <laughs> um, and uh, I'm also conscious that we only have about nine more minutes and we have a couple of great big questions that uh, people would like to uh, uh, raise. And I want to make sure that Gary uh, has enough time to tackle them. Uh, you can see what I may mean about the shift towards more uh, conceptual or strategic questions. Here's another one that comes up from uh, Brent Auernheimer, uh, California State Fresno, who asks, are we, oh, hang on, are we about to give up on the Jeffersonian ideal of a social compact of a liberally educated citizenry as necessary for democracy? Oh, that's a, a very ponderous question. Uh, and, uh, Frankly, I'm, I'm not sure where to begin. Uh, I suspect a uh, pint of a good porter uh, might, uh, for everyone might be very helpful for, for us to uh, respond to uh, figure out that question. Uh, well, I, I mean, this, is, this has come up before in previous sessions. Uh, and one of the arguments is that uh, 
uh, if we assume universal access to K through 12, which we legally provide, uh, is not sufficient for giving citizens a full education in order to participate in democracy, then it becomes the job of higher education to complete that education. Uh, the American Association of Colleges and Universities, ACNU, has made that into a key point. Uh, and this came up in uh, after the 2016 election, uh, where a lot of people argue that this is one of the jobs of higher education to, uh, to build a democracy. Um, as Charles Finley just put in the chat, I feel like such a failure as an educator. Sorry, I felt like such a failure as an educator after this election in 2016. Um, so that's one argument, um, which is a, which is independent of the economic argument. Um, Brent, we may have to return to that. Um, it's a it's a it's a powerful question. Uh, we have a few more coming in, and I want to make sure that uh, a couple of them get up here before we have to go. Uh, and this is from uh, Chris Delarocas, who follows up with another killer question. If there are not enough jobs for college educated people and we should not limit access to college education, what is the solution you propose? Yes, I mean, that's precisely the dilemma. Uh, uh, it's I don't see that there there really is a solution to, you know, you can either continue to uh, educate as many people as you can, despite uh, the outcome, um, or yeah. you can have some sort of a restrictive uh, uh, process in place to, you know, to keep people out. And, and uh, yeah, not neither alternative is attractive. So and I think, I, I think that's exactly the kind of the dilemma that higher education is caught in. It's, you know, there are no clear roads forward. Would uh, I mean, I'm just thinking out loud, and I, I uh, would would a massive expansion of federal and or state financial support to higher education then perhaps be one way forward uh, because that might take some of the financial sting out of this and give people uh, easier access to a college education without having to go in debt and worrying about it changing their lives for the worse. Yes, I mean, certainly that if it reduces people's debt loads, that would be, you know, very positive. Although keep in mind that, you know, the, 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 stu the students who default on student loans uh, most frequently are the students with the least amount of debt. So students with less than $5,000 worth of debt, you know, oftentimes they went to for-profit schools or they didn't complete their degree or, you know, they, they received an associate degree that turned out to be not uh, particularly useful. Um, uh, but yes, but, you know, the so federal funding for higher education would certainly allow, you know, higher education to continue on its its mission of educating uh, the population. But uh, the other aspect then is what do people do when they graduate college or is, you know, a, a college education going to uh, be seen as a kind of warehousing of young people as a means to keep them out of the workforce for as long as possible because the workforce can't absorb them. This is tricky. You're really uh, uh, hitting a, a terrible dilemma right now. Uh, uh, Danette Long from Northern State um, has a question which touches on this in detail. Um, is ultimately, is it the accreditation groups that keep the number of hours in place? How do they impact the proposed change? Maybe the accrediting agencies are a place to work. Yeah, it's the accreditation uh, groups, but it's also financial aid requirements, which have those accreditation uh, uh, requirements built into them. So, you know, uh, it's, it's kind of the structure of higher ed. Uh, is built around the notion of, you know, four year, even though most students don't graduate college in four years, it's still a four-year model that's in place. Um, and institutional change is very difficult uh, in education. I mean, there's been these kind of big efforts to go around uh, the, the higher ed institutions themselves. Charter schools, you know, big effort to transform uh, public, you know, K through 12 education, uh, and then, you know, massive funding by foundations uh, on the college and university scene to see what was possible there. Um, and, you know, I think 
higher education institutions are, have shown themselves to be quite flexible, uh, but there's limits. Uh, and kind of the humanistic model is one, you know, as much as humanists complain about, you know, the job focus of students and how the humanistic mission of institutions have been replaced by business motives and so on, uh, that core remains, remains pretty much intact. And it's what distinguishes uh, you know, the higher education situation from, from other aspects of society. Uh, I just want to channel a, a good friend of mine, Ruben Puentadora, who says that uh, we should support a pint of porter for everybody, um, <laughs> and everybody in the forum. Uh, Joseph Robert Shaw from UAH has uh, another question, a very precise question about this from the K-12 side. Is there a correlation between a K-12 emphasis on STEM and the growth of the overeducated class? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, you know, the kind of math deficits and math phobia that's uh, pervasive through K through 12 education and then, you know, uh, uh, is also true of uh, for higher education institutions uh, is certainly uh, uh, one that, that all the STEM programs push back against. Right. Uh, so, uh, and, and students who major in, uh, in STEM fields tend to do better job-wise than students, for instance, in social sciences or the humanities or you know, the kind of the, the worst parts of the curriculum in terms of underemployment tend to be non-technical pre-professional majors like criminal justice, uh, business management, public policy. I mean, in those fields, uh, the level, if you look at underemployment and unemployment of graduates, uh, the uh, anywhere between 60 to 80% of, of uh, graduates in those fields wind up in jobs for which you didn't need a college education. That's a huge number. Uh, yeah. We have time for one last question. And this is uh, from Don. And I, I think I understand the question, but I may be interpreting it incorrectly. So let me give you a shot at this, uh, uh, Gary. How about spreading labor hours, like requiring overtime for salaried managers? Yes. I mean, certainly, you know, one of the trends over the last really 50 years has been this big intensification of work. And part of that happened by transforming hourly employees who were entitled then to overtime uh, uh, into salaried employees in which there's no limit in terms of the amount of, of time uh, that they need to spend at the job, either you know, pre-pandemic it was at the work site, uh, but then when you you know when you weren't at work, then evenings, mornings, weekends, you were expected to be accessible through uh, email and texting and, and technology, and so you know a con you know a conversion away from salaried or salaried employees back towards hourly employment would be a very good thing for the workforce, but uh, yes, it's another proposal that one has to say, well, yes, good good luck with, with that proposal. It's difficult enough even just to get Uber drivers acknowledged as employees rather than uh, independent contractors. One thing some of us in the futurist community have been talking about is uh, mandating smaller hours per week, you know, down to 30 or 25 or something. But, but speaking of smaller hours, I'm afraid we are at the end of hours today. Um, this has been a fantastic discussion, Gary. I, 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 I'm really, really grateful. Uh, yes, you have thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah. Oh, uh, my thanks to everybody for terrific questions. Uh, before we go, Gary, uh, what's the best way for people to follow up on your new project and on your thinking as a whole? Uh, well, hopefully at some point it will be published. So <laughs> stay tuned. Well, I'll be glad to spread the word on that. And uh, once again, Gary, thank you for this research. Thank you for your time and uh, keep up the fantastic work. That's great. Thanks for the conversation. Our pleasure. Uh, don't go away, friends. Uh, we have to tell you about what's happening for the next uh, few weeks. So I want to make sure that you all get to see that. Um, but uh, once again, thank you for fantastic questions. 
uh, and fantastic comments. Uh, this has been, I, I think we ended up on an incredible dilemma that we need to follow up on, uh, where we can take higher education. In a question that uh, Gary didn't get to ask, uh, he asked, where does this take us? Uh, the timeline is not good for this. Looking ahead, we're hitting some other issues, uh, including uh, equity, active learning, academic mergers, open access, rethinking teaching. Uh, if you'd like to keep talking about these issues, uh, please just use the hashtag FTTE on Twitter or anywhere else you'd like. You can always tweet at me, at Brian Alexander, or at Shindig Events. Um, if you'd like to go into the past and take a look at our previous sessions on, on job placement, careers, economics, just head to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. We have a whole stack of sessions and the recording for this one will join them shortly. In the meantime, once again, thank you all for your thoughts. This has been a terrific, terrific discussion. I hope you all keep thinking about this and I hope you keep thinking about them with us. Uh, in the meantime, stay safe, take care as the fall semester comes close and we'll see you online. Thanks again to uh, Sam Houston State for letting us use their network and office. Bye-bye.